Okay, this is the second video lecture for chapter 8. This is the last slide that we saw, and now we're moving on to some different stuff. Um, should probation be combined with parole? There is some talk that probation and parole services could or should be uh, combined. And there are differences between probation and parole, and we listed those on the board. Uh, with parole, essentially, or rather, let's start with probation. With, with probation, you're essentially looking at some sort of alternative sentencing before or in lieu of or instead of incarceration or in addition to. It's generally something that, that's happening before the incarceration. Parole, you're looking at a system um, or a process where things are happening after the inmate has served time. So if someone serves 10 years or 15 years or 20 years on, on an offense, a parole board can come in and say, well, we know that you have more time to serve, but we think you've done well in prison, so we're going to let you out, but you have to do drug classes, you have to get a job, you have to do blah, 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 etc. And if they abide by the conditions of parole, then they can remain free instead of having to serve the remainder of that sentence. So probation is before and parole is after, essentially. Um, we're also talking about a difference in criminal lifestyle. Those who are sentenced to probation are generally... Um, not as aggressive offenders. They tend not to be sex offenders. You're talking more about property crimes, uh, drug offenses, things of that sort. With parole, you're looking at people who are, are have done more serious, have committed more serious offenses, such as murder or sexual offenses, and they've served a lot of time for that. So there are differences between the inmates. The parole, the paroled inmate, is is more aggressive, is more. Uh, maybe even considered to be more dangerous, but they've also served a lot of time, so maybe they've aged out some as well. So there are differences between the two types of offenders. Probationers are less ingrained and involved in the criminal lifestyle, whereas the parolee will be because he or she has not only committed serious crimes, but they've done a lot of time in prison on top of that, where that criminal lifestyle is ingrained within the subculture of the prison, likely. Um, there's no single best way to organize probation or parole. Now, the pre-sentence investigation report, this is really super important, uh, especially for um, professionals like me, being a psychologist working within the criminal justice system. Um, we interview inmates, uh, psychologists, social workers, uh, correctional counselors and staff. We have to compile information, and the psychologists in this state have to do what's called a report or an evaluation on every inmate who comes through the facility. And a lot of what we depend upon for this information is the pre-sentence investigation report. It's a summary report of a convicted offender's background, usually compiled by a probation officer. Um, it helps the judge to decide on an appropriate sentence. It also helps mental health professionals and other prison and correctional um, staff to compile information and to make decisions about classification and programming for the inmate within the system. Um, some are 10 pages long. I've had some pre-sentence investigation reports that are 200 pages. It just depends on the length uh, how many crimes this person's committed, victim impact statements, uh, police records, etc. that may be attached. If you have a long-term offender who's been in and out of the system 20 times, it's going to be a long report. If it's a young first-time offender, it's going to be a shorter report. Um, three steps in supervision. First, the probation officer establishes a relationship with the offender and defines the role of officer and offender. Next, the officer and offender establish supervision goals to help the offender comply with the conditions. And then the officer decides how to terminate probation. The investigative function uh, helps judges to select an appropriate sentence. Probation officers will actually make recommendations for sentencing, for how the sentences will be run if there are multiple offenses, uh, or if the inmate should be incarcerated at all. Sometimes probation officers will recommend what's called a diagnostic report. Um, you don't really have to know what that means, but sometimes probation officers will recommend more intensive a more intensive psychological evaluation to help the judge determine whether this offender should be incarcerated or not, uh, as opposed to being you know, offered probation or something or drug court or something like that. It helps with classification decisions in terms of um, in terms of placing the inmates appropriately within the system, in terms of classes and programming. Uh, it's also a document. I'm going to kind of pick and choose here what we're going to cover, but you'll have all these in your notes. Document. It's a document for systematic research. Uh, if we need to know something about an offender, we can pull up this document and we can look about uh, and look at it for information about family history, about age, about relatives, etc. It's also important for building a relationship between the probation officer and the offender. Uh, 
The purpose and content of the PSI report, verification, first of all. The PSI information is cross-checked with other sources of information like police reports, for example, uh, social history information that's acquired by correctional staff at various facilities. Objectivity, avoiding vague conclusions about the case. Uh, we want to be able to make good decisions. Uh, judges, probation officers, psychologists, case managers, we want to make good decisions about the cases. And then we have what's also called a victim impact statement. Some, some PSIs will include statements from victims basically stating how they were harmed physically, sexually, psychologically, financially, etc. by the perpetration of this offense. Some reports have victim impact statements, others do not. It just depends. But those are certainly permitted within the report and we see those as correctional staff as well. Uh, recommendations. Controversial. Recommendations are controversial because someone without authority, such as a probation officer or a psychologist such as myself, is suggesting what sentence could be appropriate. Uh, I've, I've mentioned this in class before, but one of, the, one of the heaviest things that I do with my job as a prison psychologist is to make recommendations to judges about sentencing. I have no power or authority to sentence anybody, and I would not want that power or authority. But sometimes judges will ask us to evaluate an inmate before he or she makes a decision about incarceration or not and asks our opinion. What do you think? Um, and it's tough because sometimes you've got inmates who may be low functioning or maybe they've committed a, a crime but maybe they were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, maybe they have no legal history. Maybe they have a good family support system. They have factors that would support asserting them for probation as a term uh, as opposed to incarceration. Others not so much. So it's, it's really kind of tricky and we really count on these records, especially the PSI, to kind of help us make those recommendations to judges. Congruence of the pre-sentence investigation report and sentences range from 70 to 90 percent. So judges generally go along with what the professionals recommend. Not always, but generally. So the big question is whether judges follow these, these suggestions or the experience of officers, which will allow them to come up with recommendations that the judges select. Uh, disclosure. Uh, Williams versus New York, 1949. A judge imposed a death sentence on the basis of evidence in a PSI, pre-sentence investigation report, uh, despite a jury's disclosure. And we'll talk about this. Cleansing. Confidential comments from private citizens that might endanger the citizens. Uh, anybody can say anything they want about a, an offender or a suspect. Um, and if that is confidential and that's not permitted to be opened in court and cross-examined, then that could actually hurt the offender, especially if it's not true or the suspect. Uh, especially if it is untrue. Uh, clinical statements or evaluations that might be damaging to the offender if disclosed. Uh, sometimes there are what are called private PSIs. We don't use those in West Virginia because they would cost a lot of money. Uh, and most states don't use some can, but some don't. If, if an offender has a lot of money, and that generally does not happen, then he or she may pay someone to do a their own pre-sentence investigation report to be submitted to the judge. We, we can only assume that that would be a biased document. If, if I'm an offender and I'm paying someone to put together a PSI and I'm going to have access to seeing that, I'm going to want it to look pretty good for me. So that's another reason why they're not used quite as much, or if at all. Uh, private investigative firms contract with the convicted offenders to conduct comprehensive background checks uh, at a price to the offender and suggest to judges creative sentencing options as an alternative to incarceration. The supervision function. The officer, there's role conflict because the probation or parole, well, the, proba the probation officer uh, is enforcing the law or the standards set forth by the judge, but they're also in a role where they're supposed to be helping or aiding the offender. They're supposed to be helping the offender find programs, offering encouragement, etc. So there's a, there's a role conflict that makes it difficult for probation officers. Uh, power, this is the ability to force a person to do something that they don't want to do. Uh, probation officers and judges have the power to to force offenders to, to do what they want them to do. Authority, this is the ability to influence a person's actions in a desired direction without resorting to force. Uh, you think of a, an authority figure in your life, it may be a boss, maybe a teacher, maybe a parent when you were younger. Um, these are people who influence your actions without having to force you to do it necessarily. Um, typically, the person who exercises the power in the relationship uh, lacks the authority. 
Then you have, we'll call this the last slide for, for part two, motivational interviewing. This is something that is done and used extensively in the West Virginia Division of Corrections. This is a method for increasing the effectiveness of correctional treatment by having a probation officer interact with the client in ways that promote the client's stake in the change process. So instead of just asking questions about where you're born, what's your family like, how many times have you been arrested, when did you graduate from high school, now we're asking more questions that kind of get to the heart of how the offender functions. Like, do you have any drug problems? Have you had treatment? What do you think about drug treatment? What do you think about your mental wellness? Have you had mental health treatment? How do you feel about medications that you've taken? How, what do you feel like you need to do to change? So we're now asking the offender questions, specific questions and questions in a way that promote offenders wanting to make positive changes in their life. And let's call that the end of the second video. Thanks.